according uh, to one of the creation stories in the book of Genesis, after God had created uh, the world and everything in it with all of the birds and the animals and the, and the plants and the flowers, God looked down at, at the world and, and God saw that something was missing. Um, caretakers for this beautiful creation that God had pulled together. And so, God created humankind. And as a part of creating humankind, God gave humankind a very important mission to care for all of God's creation so that all of God's children and everything that calls the earth home would be able to benefit from the abundant gifts of our God who we understood to how, in however you understand it, to have created everything. Now, the good news is that because God loves us so much, God's creation is an abundant one. God is not a God of scarcity, but a God of great abundance, and God has given us more than we could ever need for all of God's children to be okay and for the created earth to be healthy and to be in good shape. God has given us all that we ever need. But we are humans, and because we are humans, there are times that we have chosen our way instead of God's way. There are times that we have seen all of the natural resources and the beauty of creation not merely as something that we are called to take care of, but something that we are called to consume for our own needs. We've often put our own needs not just ahead of our neighbor's needs, but sometimes we've put our needs, we've, we've met our needs even at the expense of our neighbor's. And when that happens, when those things happen, the call of God and the purpose and the mission that God has given to humankind, it begins to fall short. Even though we've been given the perfect example to the life of Jesus Christ of what it looks like to love and care for the world and to love and care for those around us, we still continue to fall short. Now, whether our falling short is because um, of willful disobedience or because in spite of our best efforts, we just, we're just not perfect and no one will ever be perfect, the result is the same, that our world continues to experience brokenness and hurt. Our, 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 the world around us in its natural order experiences challenges and destruction, and it's not exactly what God wants to see. And, and even in relationships, we see brokenness. I don't have to give you a list of this. You see it all the time. Brokenness surrounds us both by our own cause and by acts of omission and acts of commission, there's brokenness going on everywhere. Now, what God has done is God has created something in response to that brokenness. I know sometimes we look at all that and we wonder, if God is all-powerful, why won't God just come in and fix it? Well, God's given us free will. And God's given us some responsibility in that. And I believe that part of God's approach to all of the brokenness of the world is the church. I believe that God created the church with a very specific purpose. And that purpose was to be the intersection between heaven and earth. And when I talk about church, I'm not just talking about an institution. I do think that the church as an institution throughout its history has done some remarkable things and our world is a better place for the, because of the church as an institution. At the same time, I think we must confess that sometimes as an institution, the church has focused more on itself than on those that it's called to serve. And as an institution, sometimes the church has fallen short. And yet, I still believe to the very core of my being that God created the church and called us together as a community to be a people who are constantly working toward bringing God's will to this earth, to finding brokenness wherever it exists and bringing hope and healing and grace and mercy. In fact, at, at First Christian Church, we take that call very seriously. At First Christian Church of Louisville, we seek to be a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. This is not a mission statement. This is an identity statement. It's a statement that defines who we are. Uh, we adopted this identity statement 10 years ago. And as we have lived into this for the past decade, I think it has been a remarkable reflection of who we are as a church. 
And one of the things that's so powerful about this statement, about our identity statement, is that it's, it's, it's less of a call to action as it is a description of the actions that this church has long participated in. From its very beginning, this church, and that beginning dates back to the 1830s, this church has been wholly dedicated to bringing healing and hope, not only to the Louisville community, but to the world far beyond Louisville. And it has done so in ways that are really, really remarkable. Um, for example, I want to tell you just one quick story, and, and I've told this story before, but I think it's so important because when we as a church talk about the things that we're doing right now, it, it's essential that we remember where we've come from. Uh, because as important as this statement is for us today, this statement is built upon the beliefs and practices of this church that go back generations. Um, in 1911, First Christian Church consecrated a glorious new structure at the intersection of 4th and Breckenridge downtown. Um, if you're ever down at 4th and Breckenridge, you'll see it. Right now, the building has just been, um, re ac uh, uh, has been acquisitioned by another church, and they're renovating it. But even on the fence, as you see it, it will tell you that it is a restoration of the historic First Christian Church of Louisville. It is a remarkable structure. It is absolutely beautiful. Um, when they dedicated it in 1911, the Reverend Dr. Um, uh, Edward Powell uh, gave a speech where he talked about the church. And I've shared this quote with you before, but it is, it is so important to the life of our church that, that I want to share it with you again because it really does, it really just illustrates that who we are today is not that different from who we've been for generations. Listen to what um, Dr. Powell said at that dedication. What is the significance of this building? What is its high purpose? The church is dedicated here and now to the worship of God and the service of man. We have no use for such a building. It would be an impertinence to call it a church unless these two things made up its life, the worship of God and the service of man. One is not complete without the other. I want this building to be as open to the people as is the heart of God. We wish no door to be closed in the face of any man who seeks sanctuary. We want our house to be built by the side of the road where those who pass may enter. We want them to feel more at home than even majesty would if it should honor us with a visit. We want this church to speak a message and give forth a ministry unto all men. 1911. While the words, we are a movement for wholeness, are nowhere to be found in that, in that, um, in that speech, boy, the theme is still the same, is it not? There are two things that Dr. Powell talked about that are so important for us as a church. And reminders of those two things are hanging behind me right now. The two banners that you see hanging on the wall were taken from that speech and were created so that we could remember as a church some of our history and how important that history is to us today and what it means to be church. Now, we've changed the language. In 1911, they were a little bit more um, gender specific. They, they weren't quite as inclusive as our language is today. And so we've changed from in the service of men to in the service of all because that's more reflective of how we speak as a community today. But these are the two things that Dr. Powell said the church must be. First, the church must be centered on the worship of God. That the church is called to come together as a community of faith to serve people in a structure kind of like this, to worship and to learn and to pray and to be together. And that that is essential for the church. But he also said that the church is called to serve all of humankind. And, and the church has to serve all of humankind, and that the church is called to serve humankind beyond its doors. The church isn't a church if it only gathers for worship and if it only serves those who call this church their home. If with, without service to others, it's not a church. And if we just simply serve others without worshiping and taking care of those who call this a home, we also are not a church. You have got to do both. And so as a church, First Christian has sought to work very hard throughout our history to live into those two things. You know, in, in 1911, 
um, it was not nearly as popular as it is in 2017 to be a place that welcomes all just as they are. I know that all means all is all the rage in 2017, but in 1911, not so much. Um, in 1911, there were many, many churches, maybe more than not, who even had people standing at its door saying, no, not you. But when this church was dedicated, it made it very clear that every single person who sought the sanctuary of God would be welcomed here, and we were to welcome even those that we saw as the lowest in society. Even we were, we were to see them with the same majesty that we see God. And when they come in, we were to treat them as though Jesus himself had walked in the door. 1911, that was the message of this church. We carry it out every Sunday when we gather around this table and we welcome anyone here um, to come and experience the grace of God here. But this isn't just new to us recently. This has been a part of this church for generations and generations. And then um, Dr. Powell talks about this importance of us getting beyond these doors. We've already talked about our identity. Our identity is to be a movement for wholeness, but, but, not just, but we can't just have an identity. We've got to have a mission. And we believe as a church that the mission was given to us by Jesus Christ himself. Um, we created a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. That's, that's human language. But our mission comes, comes from Jesus himself. And this is the mission according to Christ. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. It's, it's, it's voiced this way in the Gospel of Mark. Go into all the world and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. And then, as Jesus was commissioning those first disciples, as they were starting that first church um, after He was resurrected, um, He told them this, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be My witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. You know, I can't help but wonder when the disciples heard that if they thought Jesus was exaggerating or being hyperbolic. You know, saying, hey, I need you to go out there and, and share this message with the entire world. And they're thinking, okay, Jesus, I think just outside the walls in Jerusalem here will be challenging enough. I wonder what the disciples would think today when you can almost point to the fact that the gospel has been taken literally to every corner of this globe. Now, there are some exceptions, no doubt. But I can't imagine that those disciples, if they would see where the gospel has been taken today, that they would not be absolutely blown away by the truth of Jesus' words. I think we take it for granted that we're worshiping here in Louisville, Kentucky in 2017 and are a part of a church like this. Um, the disciples, th this is what they geared their whole life toward. This is their legacy. And it's such an incredible story. And, and right now, we as a church are continuing to write that story. And everything we do is about adding to this greatest story that's ever been told in human history, the story of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and how we as those who call Him our Lord and Savior, how we're out in the world trying to make the world a better place. This is our chapter, right? This story hasn't been written for us, right? The story is also is also being written by us. This is our turn. And again, over the next several weeks, we're going to be really celebrating how we as a church are continuing to, to live into the legacy of what First Christian Church of Louisville has always been, but more importantly, the legacy of who God calls us to be as followers of Christ. We're going to be, we're going to be talking quite a bit about that over the next few weeks. But before we talk about how we're going to continue to write the story and celebrate the story that we've already written, um, I want to do uh, something really important, and that's to recognize um, at least a couple people uh, who've written the story up to this point. Because we're standing on a very strong foundation. And it's not just a foundation of brick and mortar. It's a foundation of some saints who have been a part of this church um, uh, that have made all the difference in the world. We wouldn't be here without them. And there are too many to name. Uh, but today, as we begin to celebrate some of the ministries we're doing, I want to celebrate two people who have helped create a foundation in this church, who've left a legacy that, that is helping to change everything. Faye and Shirley Watson. Um, Faye and Shirley Watson were members of this church for the majority of their life. I, I never got the chance to know Shirley. She died before uh, I came to serve in ministry at First Christian Church, but I did get the chance to know Faye. 
Um, those of you who know Fay, uh, who knew Fay, he died several years ago. Those of you who knew Fay, um, you knew him because he stood at the door every single Sunday, rain or shine, and welcome people into this um, community of faith. Those of you who didn't know Faye, you're about to meet him, because I'm going to show you a video that we created for Faye's 90th birthday. And since we showed it in worship on his 90th birthday, I have been looking for an excuse to show it again, and today's the day. Um, I want you to meet this guy, uh, and unfortunately, surely he's not a part of this, but I want you to meet Faye. I want you to see his ministry. Uh, for those of you who've never met him, you're getting ready to. For those of you who have, um, get ready for a trip down memory lane. Um, by the way, we all look younger uh, in, in, this, um, in this video. I'll never forget Faye's 90th birthday. He had no idea any of this was happening, and, and I'm not sure he wanted any part of it, um, but we all knew it was happening, and we, we brought him in, and we showed this video, and when it was over, we gave him a plaque uh, that was a door knocker, and everybody in the church just went crazy. Everybody was standing up, and, and they, were, they were applauding, and they were laughing, and they were cheering, and, and Faye just, I thought he might say something, but he just walked out. <laughs> Kid you not. Everybody's clapping. He just goes out the door. Guess where he went? To the door. He went to the door. We, we had to bring him in. He, he went to the door because that's, that was Faye. And, and one, of the, one of the legacies that Faye left was if you know him, you've been greeted by him. And you felt the, he loved you the way God loved you. And he welcomed you into this place and to this table the way I believe God would do so. But there's something that I learned about Faye and Shirley that I didn't know until after Faye died. They lived a very humble life. And if you knew where they lived and if you knew how they lived, you would never have guessed this. Um, but over the course of their life, they saved money. And when they died, they left over $2 million um, to organizations that they believed in. They gave over $850,000 to First Christian Church. They gave over half a million dollars to Lexington Theological Seminary. They gave over half a million dollars to, Christ, to the Christian care centers in, down, in downtown Louisville and, and a ministry that spread throughout the state. They gave over $200,000 to the Salvation Army. Imagine a world if we all lived so humbly in order that we could give so generously. Before he died, Faye said to one of his best friends, Anita Brooks, about his money, he said this. He said, Anita, my biggest fear is that the church will let dust grow on my money. I don't want any dust being left on my gift. A few years after Faye died, um, we transformed the way we live into our financial practices at First Christian Church. And a part of the reason that we did that was to honor, Faye, honor Faye's request and to honor those who've given money to this church throughout the course of their lifetime, that no more dust would be gathered on the gifts that they've given. To that point, this church depended on investment income just to pay the bills those gifts that were given by the saints going all the way back to the 1830s that we still had in permanent funds, they weren't helping us expand ministry at all. It's not that we weren't doing good things with those gifts, but we really weren't expanding ministry. And in order to honor them and to honor their legacy, we as a church decided, you know what, we're going to pay our own way. We're going to pay for our story. And then we're going to let those saints who have come before us we're going to let them write a story of expansion and movement that's going to take ministry out into brand new places and ways. And when you look at what we've done over the course of the last three years, it is phenomenal to see what has changed once we started shaking the dust off the gift of our, off, off those legacy gifts that we've been given. We've renovated a sanctuary. We've completely renovated a new use space. We've put signage around what people often describe as a, as a confusing campus, both outside and inside. We've renovated three bathrooms. Um, we've done all kinds of things to make this place where we come and worship more fitting as a house of God. In these three years, we've started over 85 new ministries that have gone out to make a difference in our community and around the world, totaling almost $200,000 in life-changing offerings. There's no dust in any of those stories. 
It's being shaken off and light is shining and it is the most remarkable thing I think I've ever seen in ministry. It's so fascinating to watch and it's so exciting to see. And I do think it honors those who've come before us. They've laid the foundation and it's a strong one. But it's our turn to continue to build on that foundation and write the story. Every time I come into this building and every time I see the work that you're doing outside of this building, I not only give thanks for your gifts, but I give thanks for people like Faye and Shirley and those people who've come before us who've built such a strong foundation so that we can do remarkable things for the sake of the gospel. Over the course of the next few weeks, we are going to celebrate ministry. We're going to celebrate the good work that God is doing in our midst and the good work that you're doing on behalf of God. This is going to be a really exciting month. And on, on, the, on the week before Thanksgiving, we're going to come together and we're just going to, it is going to be so fun to hear all these stories and see everything that's happening. Friends, we are a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world and I believe we're making a difference. I also believe that we are still living into that call, that we are to take the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere, around the world in whatever way that we can, from our doorstep to the ends of the earth. May we continue to build upon the legacy that was written for us and write a new chapter for generations to come. Amen.